Hello students, in lesson number 79, we learned how to play the King's Indian attack, but more specifically, we learned to play it like Bobby Fischer used to play it. We went over games and positions like these ones that allowed us to see how aggressive it could turn, and of course, everyone has to go through these games, but what if the black pieces choose to do something like this, where they put the pawn on e5 before we do, and forget about the plans that we learned from uh, Fischer's games. Also, what if we still get a position like this one, which is exactly what Bobby Fischer got, but we don't feel like doing e5. We just don't want to do what he did. We want to do something like e takes e5. And like I said last time, guys, I, I really liked playing the way Bobby Fischer played it, but when I got to a certain level, my opponents simply knew how to handle it and they wouldn't let me get that far. So I had to adjust and I found other ideas that I want to share with you. So in this lesson, I'm going to show you two of my games. These are games that I played in tournaments, classical games played against other title players. And the second game that we're going to go over, I didn't play that well and I got to a point where I had a very inferior position, but thanks to a few rules and guidelines that I followed throughout the middle game, I was able to keep my game together and come back and win the game. So I wanna share all of this with you. And right now you're going to see on your screen Two positions. The position on the left is a position that I put guys on the on the community tab in my channel for you to find the answer. And then the position on the right is going to be a position from this game that I'm going to show you towards the end of the lesson. Now, if you look at the two positions, you're going to see some patterns. I have the A file open and my rook is on it. I also have a very nice diagonal for my last square bishop. And if you look at the C4 square, it looks like a very nice outpost for, for my knight. So these are things that I'm always trying to uh, get in my middle game positions when I play the King's Indian attack. So hopefully these games allow me to illustrate it for you and you start getting these patterns and you try to recreate it and keep them in your games. This is what it means guys, knowing your openings, but also knowing the typical middle games that you get out of such openings. So let's get to the games. The first game I was playing as the white pieces and I started with the move e4. Now, in the second game that I'm going to show you, you're going to see that I started with knight f3. And I also talked about this in our last lesson. You could get to the King's Indian attack setup in different ways. Now, I'm gonna tell you later why I played e4 in this game and why I played knight f3 in the other game. So after e4, my opponent did e6, French defense, d3, d5, knight d2. Very important, guys, if you don't do knight d2 right now, they could take, and when you take back, this queen could take on d1. So we need the knight over here at this moment. So after knight d2, c5, notice how this started as a French, but now this looks like something that could have come out of the Sicilian defense. c5 first, and then e6. So after c5, I did knight g to f3, then knight c6, g3, knight f6, bishop g2, and now my opponent decided to bring the bishop to g7 instead of e7. Not a big deal to me. So after g6, I just castled, bishop g7, rook e1. And now, guys, I got to the king's Indian attack setup. My knight is on d2. Look at my pawn structure. I have my fianchetto with the bishop in it. My rook is on e1. And at this point is when we have to decide what is going to be our middle game plan. In the games that we've reviewed last lesson, we saw e5 to gain space on the king side and so on. Now, in this position specifically, it doesn't really make sense because after knight d7, we also have the bishop putting pressure on it. Even when it makes sense, guys, even if this bishop is here, this is what I said last time. I like to take on d5 sometimes. Depending on my opponent, depending on the round of the tournament, depending on, my, on many things, I might go for uh, the e5 push and play more aggressively or I could take on d5. So in this game, I just decided to take on d5 and my opponent took with the knight. Guys, it doesn't really matter if they take with the knight or the pawn. The plan that you're about to see is going to work regardless. So let me show you first um, what happened in, in the next few moves. So knight takes d5 and now this is the plan. Once you take, you, you want to break on d4. So you're going to do knight b3. This comes with a tempo. So if we go back a few moves, Notice that e takes e5, they need to react to it. Knight b3, they need to react to it. So b6, and now my knights, along with the queen, are ready to support d4. Now, sometimes, guys, if they do, um, after e takes e5, if they do e takes e5, you could do knight b3, same thing, and then you break on d4. Now, sometimes this bishop is going to be on e7, 
defending c5. So coming knight b3 is not going to be uh, winning a tempo. So what I do sometimes is I do d4 right away, and then I go knight b3. I'm going to pick up that pawn, and then I'm going to have a knight in front of an isolated pawn. And I know we haven't talked about it that much, but if your opponent has an isolated pawn, you want to fix it, block it, ideally, with a knight. So to me, I like those positions. Many people don't. I know it's not as exciting as the attacks that we saw in Bobby Fischer's games, but I really like these positions. And you're going to see in, in this game, after knight d5, knight b3, b6, d4, my opponent did not take, but if they had taken, guys, I really like this position. I'm already seeing things like a pawn majority on the queen side, and I know it doesn't make more sense now, but I'm already thinking of the end game. Okay, if I get to an end game, I have a pawn majority on the side further away from the kings, and that could allow me to create a pass pawn and have an edge. So small things like this make this position uh, comfortable for me. So let me go back a few moves. Again, from this moment, after my opponent castled, I did e takes e5, knight takes e5, knight b3 hitting c5, and now pawn to d4. Now, in this game, my opponent did not take, he just went pawn to c4. And I'm okay with that, so time to go back. I'm not concerned about this pawn being captured because I'm hitting c4. So my opponent did c3. I cannot take, guys, because then my queen gets trapped. So the moment I did c3, I went knight e4, and I know my knight is going around, but this pawn, they're just moving pawns, and they're just creating weaknesses along the way. So after knight e4, he took, bishop takes on b2, look at this bishop now, bringing more support to e5, I developed my last minor piece, and now he has to be careful with e4. So my opponent at this point did b5, look at this move, every time my opponent moves a pawn, guys, in my brain, something pops up, like what weakness did he create? So b5 is now controlling c4, but that pawn is not controlling c5 anymore. And this bishop is not on this diagonal, so the dark squares are going to be weak. So b5 happened, and I just went knight to e5. I'm already bringing my knights to the center. I like this pawn here to help me out. If they took, then I have pawn takes pawn, supporting my knight to go to d6. And we have talked about knight outpost and things like that. So after knight e5, of course my opponent did not take, they went knight c2 e7, then queen e2, queen a5, and now look at this, my knight is already jumping to dark squares. Maybe knight d6 is not that good here, maybe it's not that accurate, but notice that I know what my plan is. I need to use those dark squares. So I just went knight to d6 and now my opponent went queen to b4. At this point guys, I really encourage you to pause the video and think of what you would do next if you were the white pieces. You're playing in a tournament game, you got to this position, what would you do next? Notice that the queen is attacking the bishop and the knight. Okay guys, so this is a good opportunity to reinforce something that I told you a few lessons ago. When I'm playing my game, I like to look at every move, just for a second, even moves that don't look Good, like I'm looking at moves like knight takes g6, knight takes f7, this knight takes f7, knight takes b5. Like if I just look at this, it takes me a second to realize that if pawn takes, I have nothing to, to follow up. So I just put that aside. But if you do this enough, you're going to get to the point that in one second, you just look at these things quickly and at least you consider them. Now, many of you maybe thought of knight takes c8, liquidating that and then taking care of the bishop. Well, I happen to look into this move, knight takes b5 and it made sense to me, guys. If they take the bishop, notice that my knight is controlling these squares, so my rooks could come to b1, and it's sort of like what happened when they take the poison pawn. The queen starts getting in trouble just because they got something that they shouldn't. So knight b5 happened in the game, and now my opponent just went bishop takes e5. I think this move was really, really bad, because now when I take back, my pawn is perfect here controlling these dark squares, the black pieces gave up the, one of the most important pieces, which is the fianchetto bishop. So after d takes e5, bishop a6, now pawn to c4, protecting, attacking, and now my queen is keeping an eye on that, on that bishop. So bishop takes b5, and guys, when I take on b5, notice again, 2 versus 1, so I have a pawn majority 
on the on the queen side, which is further away from from the kings. After c takes b5, queen a4. They don't want me to protect that pawn. Now, guys, at this point, this is a critical moment. I want to evaluate the position, and I already see again two versus one on the queen side. I have pair of bishops versus uh, the two knights. I like my pawn here on e5, and the only thing that I don't like that much is that my pawn is a little bit weak. So I thought of this move, and this is something that we saw in the Bobby Fischer's games, but of course not with the same intention. So here I did bishop e4. Notice that from that game, I have this pawn on e5, we talked about it, even though I'm not attacking on the king side. This bishop is coming to e4, again, not to attack on the king side, but after they did rook b8, my bishop came to d3. So I'm flexible to keeping my bishop on this diagonal, but also sometimes I need to bring it to a different diagonal to help. So after bishop d3, rook f to c8, I don't like those rooks getting so, so active. So I just went rook e to c1, they took, rook takes, now rook c8, and I'm happy to rush into the end game because I'm already winning, guys. Pair of bishops should be superior in this case. I have an extra pawn and I'm about to create a pass pawn at some at some point. So here I just went queen c2. I'm happy to trade queens as well. And they took. This is already completely winning for whites. I'm going to show you quickly the final moves. But the main thing from this game is for you to see, guys, how we transition from that position in the opening into the middle game. And we had a very comfortable game. So after bishop c2, knight before. Now here, quickly, we have talked about this pattern many times. The bishop likes to be two squares away from the knight. Probably bishop b3 was, was more accurate, but to me, it immediately, immediately clicks in my head. Bishop two squares away from, from the knight. So after bishop b1, knight b6, then pawn a3, I don't like that knight over here. So the knight goes to d5, bishop d4, activating my bishop, knight c7, putting pressure on, on b5. So bishop d3. Now look, again, two versus one on the side away from the kings and they try to rush to bring the king into the game, but it's just too late. So pawn a4, I don't really mind it if they take, because I take on a7 and then my pass pawn goes. So after a4, they took, bishop takes on a7, knight goes to d5, then bishop c2 attacking the knight, knight a goes to b6, and then bishop b3, I'm threatening to take on, on d5, if they take with the pawn, this one falls. If they take with the knight, then my pawn goes and they have to give me that knight. So after bishop b3, they went knight c8. I took on d5 and my opponent resigned. There's nothing they could do, guys. e takes d5 again. I push. If they take on a7, I push. And that knight is going to be too clumsy to stop the pawn. Again, guys, very simple game. Nothing so exciting. But I think that if you go back and you, re and you review these ideas carefully, you could use them in some of your games. All right, now let's go over the second game that I wanted to show you. And this is a game, guys, I played it against a FIDE master from Canada. This was in the World Open in Philadelphia. And I have to say, I started the game with Knight F3 because the game that you saw before, I played it, I think, three years before this game. And back then, I had my openings sharp. I was ready to play my main repertoire. But when I played this tournament, I didn't feel so comf confident about my opening repertoire. So I, I wanted to avoid all of the openings that come out of e4. They could play the Carol Can, they could play e5, the Scandinavian. So I just said, you know what, I'm going to play knight f3, I'm going to force my way into a king's Indian attack, and I avoid all of that theory that I have to memorize. So that's the reason why I did knight f3 here, and in the other game, you saw me start with e4. Now, my opponent did g6, and you're going to see how this looks very symmetrical until later in the game. So after I castled, they castled, and now after I did e4, finally, I have my king's Indian attack set up and then my opponent did c5. Now, guys, this is exactly the same as if we had started with pawn to e4 and pawn to c5 as the first move. That would be a Sicilian defense and then we transpose into this position. Now, after I did rook to e1, my opponent did e5. So forget about everything else. If they did this, then we cannot apply any of the plans that we learned in our older lesson. So how do I play this? Well, guys, I told you back when we learned about the perk defense in lesson 69, I like to mix ideas from the King's Indian defense into the perk, into the King's Indian attack, and so on. If you already went over lesson number 43 in this course, 
you should have seen a game that I presented to you played by Kasparov as the black pieces versus Kramnik. And in this game, Kasparov sacrificed the queen for two minor pieces. It was a great game. But if you look at the position on the thumbnail, you're going to see that I have a position pretty similar like this. And you're going to see the move. I mean, it was he played it with the black pieces, but the equivalent would be a move like a4. And you're going to see why we did this. You can see it from the thumbnail again, but you're going to see that in this game, I took that idea from the king's in defense and I used it over here. Do you have to do it? No, but I'm just presenting it to you in case you want to, to give it a try. So at this point, I just went pawn to a4. And in case you haven't figured it out yet, guys, this idea is because I want my knight to go to c4 and I don't want any pawns able to prevent me from doing so. So a4, just like Kasparov did in that game of the King's Indian Defense, I'm going to do it here to uh, make this available for my knight. So they went knight to c6, then pawn to c3. Now this move, guys, I'm still open to doing d4 at some point, but I'm also keeping this knight away from going to d4. And don't feel too bad about this pawn getting weaker because there's no semi-open file for them to put pressure on it. So after c3, bishop g4, then knight b to d2, same moves that we used to, and then queen to d7. If you have been following this course, we have talked about this pattern. You saw it in the 150 attack and things like that. So they're trying to do bishop h3 to remove my Fanchero bishop. After queen d7, I just went knight to c4, you see? This move, that was the idea for, for a4. Now they cannot do b5, at least not right away. And also, I'm putting pressure on d6, so if they did bishop h3, I might even consider taking, and when the queen leaves, I just pick up that pawn on d6. So they went 98. And this is a move that it's a little bit concerning because not only are they defending, they're also getting ready to, to break on, on f5. So I just went 93. I'm hitting that bishop. I'm keeping an eye on f5. And my knight is also keeping an eye on d5. This is a very nice square for my knight. So I wouldn't mind improving from c4 to d5. So 93, bishop h3. And now, guys, I want you to pause the video and think what you do in this position. Well, if you did pause the video and you thought of this move bishop h1, then you've been paying attention to our last lessons. Bishop h1 is a move that I like to do because I keep my light squares bishop. There's no weakness. They cannot do much since my bishop is still on the board. I really, whenever I see this plan, many times I, I like to move my rook. That way I'm able to do this plan. If not, they will be hitting the rook. So bishop h1, again guys, I'm not sure how accurate this move was. Maybe it's a bad move, but these are mechanisms, these are ideas that I'm used to and it, they just come automatic to me. So in many cases, I just do it because I'm comfortable with them and I know what to do in this middle game. So after bishop h1, pawn to h6, now pawn to a5, gaining more space on the, on the queen side, rook b8, and now my queen comes over to a4. From this point on, you're going to see how my game starts getting really weird. I get into a very uncomfortable position and I just didn't like it. So this is another reason why I wanted to show you this game. Sometimes you get into bad positions, you just have to acknowledge it and do whatever it takes to fix it and to come around and win and win the game. So after queen a4, my opponent went b5, I did en passant, Pawn takes b6, and now finally my knight goes to d5. Right here, guys, I'm threatening a simple tactic, so see if you can figure it out. Let's say the black pieces had done a very bad move like pawn h5. The tactic is going to be queen takes c6, queen takes c6, and then knight e7 with a fork picking up the queen. Of course, my opponent knows what he's doing, so he did b5, and now I really wanted to make that work. I don't know what I was thinking. I went queen a6. I'm still threatening the same thing to do knight e7, but it just doesn't make any sense. So my opponent simply went king h7. Now I don't have any trick. That was just a one move threat, guys, which is horrible. So I don't have it anymore. My queen is misplaced on a6, and you're going to see how I had to pay a price for this. So now I went knight to d2. I'm trying to reroute this knight, which is doing nothing over here. Then knight c7, getting rid of my good knight. And now my queen again is a little bit weird on a6, so I just went queen a2. Look at this, guys. It takes a lot of courage to do this. Many people, they get into positions that are not good, and they just don't want to accept it, and they don't want to go back and accept the consequences. Sometimes, this is what it takes for you to turn a game around. Acknowledge your mistake, and if you have to waste tempos and moves, do it, but make sure that you fix 
your position. So bishop e6 happened now, hitting the queen again, and now look at this ugly position that I got. Queen, bishop without development, this bishop back here, all, almost all of my pieces are on the first rank. So this is horrible, but you're going to see how by following some main guidelines, we were able to navigate through this middle game and make it work. So after queen b1, my opponent went f5, and it makes a lot of sense. My pieces are on the other side, undeveloped, they want to go over and attack my king. However, by doing this move, they allow me to open up this bishop. And you're going to see how this bishop was the start of the game. So after e takes a5, bishop f5, they're happy to have the bishop on the same diagonal as my queen, so knight e4. They cannot do d5, or I take on, on c5. And now knight d8, finally my bishop is going to e3, you see? I'm fixing my problems. And now b4. Guys, here... The last thing I want to do is activate their pieces. So if I do something like pawn takes, they take with a rook and they're going to be putting a lot of pressure on b2. If I let them take, well, they also open up the file for the rook and they get active. So I needed to keep this locked, especially since I'm behind in development. I cannot let them attack if I'm behind in development. So pawn to c4, keeping things closed, then knight e6, and now this is something that you saw in the position that I put in the community tab, which is rook a6. The rook that is on the open file, we need to use it. Having it there is not enough. So rook a6, putting pressure on d6. And just like in that other game, it made my opponent react and make some concessions. So after rook a6, they took on e4. And now look at this bishop. Guys, you don't want to take with the pawn, because then this bishop is going to become bad again. So bishop e4. My bishop from the center is controlling the queen side and controlling the king side. So they gave me that, their bishop, and they activated mine. So after bishop e4, they just went bishop f6. And now, guys, what is the only piece that I need to activate? Well, the queen. The bishop that was here is gone. The rook is gone. The knight is gone. Now, my queen needs to come to the king side. Look at these bishops. And I found the easiest plan, which is queen d1. And then I could travel to the king side. So queen d1 happened, and the game was over in a few more moves. So rook f to d8, trying to protect d6, I guess, and then moving the queen. But now it is just too late. Guys, pause the video here and see if you can come up with the next move. All right, I'm pretty sure that it didn't take you that long to find queen h5. Guys, the pawn is pinned, and now my queen is putting pressure on both pawns. So queen h5 came over, queen g7 to defend, and now the final combination. If you didn't pause the video before, please do it now, because my opponent resigned in the next three moves. I did three more moves, and they resigned. There is a force combination here that I really want to know if you could find it. Well, if you pause the video, then you should have found this move, guys. I'm going to do it in our head first, and then I'm going to move the pieces. So the first move is bishop h6. I realize that they have to take with the queen, and then that queen is going to be pinned. So I have bishop takes to 6 the king cannot take, the queen is here, the queen cannot take because it's pinned, so at that point, they have to do king g7, only move to keep an eye on this queen. So again, bishop h6, queen takes, bishop g6, king has to go to g7, and now guys, my rook comes from the open file, goes to the 7th rank, hitting the king, and they have no choice but to move the king, and then I take on a6. Ironically, none of the black pieces, the other black pieces, are coordinated enough to block my check. So, bishop a6, queen takes, bishop g6 check, only move to keep an eye on the queen, and now this move, rook a7, there's nothing they could do, guys, to, to block the check. So, anything that they could have done was not going to stop me from taking all of the pieces. Of course, my opponent resigned from the moment I did rook a7, but again, guys, this was a game that... I was completely losing, at least I was really uncomfortable, and I was able to turn things around. But more than that, the main thing from this game, just like the other one, is for you to understand these plans, guys, to transfer from the opening into the middle game. Again, in this game, my opponent did e5, and the plan that I like to do many times is to do, let me go back here, okay, so the moment they did pawn to e5, I'm thinking of putting my knight on c4, so a4 makes a lot of sense to me. So. Look into this, look into that game that I showed in lesson number 43 from Kasparov, because you're going to see this again in action. Plus, you're going to see one of Kasparov's masterpieces. With that said, guys, I'm going to leave it here. 
like always we're going to talk in the comments let me know of any questions or comments that you might have so until next time